Halo. Halo was the game that created my passion for gaming. While it wasn't the first game I ever played, that title would go to Pokemon Red on my Yellow Brick Game Boy, it was the first game that I fell in love with. As I grew up, Halo stuck with me through childhood, into my teenage years and even as an adult to this day. Every time I replay Halo, the opening theme, the over the top action and this one line still gives me chills. But at the age of 11, I had no idea why Halo was so good. I was just happy breezing through the campaign with my friends and facing off against the imaginative Covenant enemies. In hindsight, the reason I loved Halo was probably the sense of scale, the inventive sci-fi setting, the revolutionary first person shooter mechanics and the fact it was unlike anything I'd seen before. So as a huge Halo fan, I was extremely excited when Disintegration was announced, a brand new IP from Halo's co-creator Marcus Leto. And like Halo, Disintegration is unlike anything we've seen before. With hybrid first person shooter and real time strategy gameplay, and developed by a brand new studio with a mix of 30 graduate and veteran developers, Disintegration could truly be something special. Well, Disintegration is special. Its premise, setting and gameplay are all unique, but it pains me to say this, there are fundamental flaws with encounter design, player restrictions and repetition that hold the game back from greatness. Because there is a lot of greatness within Disintegration, be it with the crisp FPS mechanics or the synergy created between RTS units, it is most definitely there. At times I had a lot of fun with the game, but in the end the obvious flaws stifled my experience at key moments. It's within these moments I was the most frustrated when really I should have been praising a game which had the potential to be revolutionary. Disintegration's greatest strength is its premise. Humanity is on the brink of collapse and people have transplanted their brains into robotic shells through a process known as integration. There's an evil faction, called the Rayon, who harvest humans, or naturals as they're called here. It's never explained why everybody is integrated, or what the motives are behind each side, but for whatever reason, I was interested in Disintegration's world from the very start. I wanted to learn more, and find answers to my already burning questions. Why did people integrate? Why does Rayon want to enslave humanity? What was the aftermath of this catastrophic event? But unfortunately, these questions are never answered. Sometimes, snippets of information are revealed when you visit a new location, like the first time I scanned a Rayon outpost and saw a human harvesting machine, or when my crew discussed the haunting origins of a derelict city we were battling through. Uh, all those poor people who thought they were getting out. Forts were the first places the Rayon knocked down. That's pretty dark, right? Except this moment is ruined by cringeworthy dialogue from one of my crew. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Rayon Air with non-stop flights from the frying pan to the fire. <laughs> what? Key information like this is gradually revealed without ever giving too much away. I did find this slightly frustrating at times, but others may like the air of mystery V1 Interactive have created. I felt most in the dark when starting Disintegration for the first time. Oddly, like Infinity War, we start in the middle of a scene, except here we've not had 20 prior films to explain what's happening. True freedom, in service of a higher calling, join the Rayon. An ex grav cycle rider and lead protagonist Roma is being interrogated by the head of the Rayon, Black Shuck. Black Shuck. I honestly found it hard to take Black Shuck seriously, as his name sounds like a campy supervillain from a 70s comic book. You escape from Black Shuck and quickly team up with a ragtag crew of outlaws who also want to take Shuck down and his huge spaceship along with him. The sense of scale imposed by this thing was jaw dropping. It swallows up the sky and does an excellent job of making you feel overwhelmed by your mission. Within the crew are a colourful cast of characters, each with unique personalities and visual appearance. Doyle is an ex-police officer and now occupies a large robotic frame. Make some space for the big guns. 609 grew up in the hood where rival gangs shouted out your door number, hence the name. Better late than never. 
and Koki, a lovable joker who dances after victory in battle. They all reminded me of the Spartans from Halo Reach, who all share similar appearances and personality traits. Doyle especially reminded me of George. So, where's this architect's head? So, it's gonna be like that. There are also opportunities to learn more about your crew in between missions. Here, you enter a Destiny-style hub which ranges from inside the team hangar to the roof terrace of a skyscraper. During this downtime, you chat to your crew, collect challenges, or upgrade Roma and your units. The upgrades are pretty basic, like plus 10% attack damage, but I appreciated how there was some form of progression to chase after. If you decide to speak to your crew here, they never really have anything interesting to say. The worst offender was a crew member telling me they missed their dog. I mean, we may die at the hands of an evil faction any minute now. Why are you telling me about your French bulldog? I had a French bulldog named Napoleon. That dog was always by my side, or under my feet. I guess V1 is trying to remind us that these robotic people are actually human, but there are better ways to do this. Tell me about each character's hopes, dreams, fears or worries, things that actually make us human. There was so much potential to develop these characters and the world they live in further, but most opportunities were just not explored. There's also a forced romance between two characters who have zero on-screen chemistry, mainly because, well, one is a robot. It's safe to say I was cringing a lot during these moments, and trying my hardest not to picture what a romantic relationship between a robot and a human looks like. Overall though, I did enjoy how the campaign took you across many varied exterior locations, including some beautiful Icelandic vistas. It's just the basic dialogue, lack of depth the narrative, and a handful of cringeworthy moments that grated on me over its 10 hour playtime. I really wanted to love this campaign, but there were just so many opportunities that weren't looked into. So, the campaign never reveals more depth than the original premise, or by the tiny breadcrumbs left by each character, but how is the gameplay? Well, as nothing interesting is added, the end result is a pretty generic FPS campaign. This is of course fine if the narrative creates unique and interesting missions, and occasionally this is true, like one standout mission involving a prison break and a sticky grenade launcher, but most of the time, the missions resort to either rescuing people or attacking an enemy resource like an EMP blackout tower. And there's even an escort mission. If it was up to me, escort missions would be scrapped from gaming as a whole. I've never enjoyed these types of missions as they slow gameplay down to a gruelling slog. I mean, look how slow this thing moves. In defense of V1, they have added variety by creating unique grav cycles, different units, varied weapons and several enemy types. I really clicked with a handful of these weapons, like the dual miniguns, homing rockets, and my favourite the nanotrite healing gun, which has one of the best sounds ever put to code associated with it. The pace V1 gave out new weapons was also appreciated although I wish we were allowed to customise our loadout. For every mission, your weapons and units are predetermined and can't be changed. This means if you found a combination you like, you'll likely only get to use it a couple of times. While this is slightly annoying, my main issue with the campaign is the constant wave defence sections at the end of every mission. On the recommended difficulty setting, these sections were extremely frustrating due to crazy spikes in difficulty. Most times, you're placed in a square arena and tasked to defend it as enemies attack from every side. It really forces you into a corner as enemies bombard you from every angle. While I do appreciate that enemies who flank you create uncomfortable situations, it just doesn't work for disintegration. For one, you're hovering in mid-air which means there's nowhere to cover. Because the grav cycle is slow moving, and also takes a second to build momentum, it is usually impossible to avoid taking damage. There's a boost to help here, but it takes so long to recharge that you're always on the back foot. I genuinely found alternating ascend and descend while strafing side to side like I was playing a rhythm game did help. 
but only slightly. If you are thinking of playing Disintegration, just be prepared to see a lot of this. It's important to note that this problem only exists during the final wave defence sections, simply due to the sheer number of enemies the game throws at you. Plus, since you're locked into a loadout, there's a high chance you won't have the right tools for the job. This happened to me on a few missions where I was left with no healing ability. My only option was for either my units to heal me, this didn't work as they were getting battered too, or to cower in a corner and wait for the painfully long auto heal to kick in. This didn't work either as the AI will literally hunt you down. I dreaded the end of a level as these sections were repetitive and frustratingly difficult. Sure, you're expected to sit back and command units from afar, but when enemies spawn behind you, what are you supposed to do? I'm in it's such a shame that these moments ruined it for me, as the enemy design is amazing. There's a great mix of weak and stronger enemies, all with interesting mechanics. I personally enjoyed the Thunderbird bosses, who were like mini War of the World walkers or Mass Effect Reapers. and the beefy rhino unit who could be stunned with a grenade to stop them charging. I even enjoyed having dogfights against enemy grav cycles, although I thought they were too overpowered in general. After a while though, everything starts to get repetitive as enemies, like the Thunderbird, are used too frequently. Thunderbirds are easy to take down, but they take a long time to do so. They are absolute bullet sponges, and after a while it feels like you're going through the motions. When the fourth Thunderbird spawned in a mission, I honestly rolled my eyes. They should have been held back a bit longer, or just not used so frequently. In the early hours of disintegration, I thought the FPS mechanics were pointless, as V1 gives you the worst weapon in the game, the dual assault rifles. They are seriously underpowered and barely scratch your enemies, and because you haven't had a chance to upgrade your health, you die after a few hits. Early on, if you play Disintegration like an FPS, which many FPS fans probably will, you will get obliterated. The only option is to sit back and chip away at an enemy's health bar, like you're playing a support class in a MOBA. So if you're not actively engaging in combat, what is the point in having a weapon in the first place? Within these initial moments, I wish the FPS side of Disintegration had been scrapped, and the focus was on the original RTS gameplay. Thankfully, my opinion did change after the first few hours. Once you've upgraded Roma, and V1 gives you a new weapon, everything starts to gel and the game shines. At times I had to stop and remind myself that Disintegration was developed by a team of 30 people, as it feels phenomenal to play. The FPS mechanics are chunky, mechanical, and have outstanding sound design, elevating every encounter to stratospheric heights. Correct. You are approaching a small pocket of iron cloud debris. Go in for the kill! Focus. It feels as good as other AAA FPS games like Halo, Rage 2 or Doom, or even Dest- Okay, not quite as good as Destiny, but it does feel good. I also appreciated how hovering in midair added something new to the genre. Usually in FPS games you're on the ground and stray from side to side to make yourself hard to hit, but in Disintegration, and as you're always hovering, you have to dodge vertically too. It was an interesting take using all 360 degrees to take down your enemies. Of course though, when you're in midair your main role is to scan the battlefield and order units to attack. I always found this perspective thought provoking as I carefully planned out the best way to assault a Rayon base but every single time, my plan never came to fruition. As you're constantly hovering, you're spotted from a mile off, immediately alerting the enemy you're about to attack. Any strategy is also simplified due to the lack of options for your units. You can't order them to cover, suppress fire, or split into smaller groups. This was frustrating when fighting grav cycles using a mix of range and melee units. As my melee unit couldn't attack the grav cycle, he was left to aimlessly roam around the battlefield. There are other times when your units don't engage with the enemy and stand there completely surrounded. 
You literally have to hold their hand and order them to attack. Other times they're the opposite and become far too aggressive. 609 was the worst offender here. He was honestly a madman. He would frequently charge into a group of enemies only to get downed and jeopardise the mission. There are options to recall your troops here, but when so much is happening on screen, multitasking is tough. In busy encounters, I always felt at a disadvantage as the enemy AI is surprisingly intelligent, yet you're given a band of idiots. Again, you're never given the right tools to get the job done. But if you accept disintegration as a simple RTS game, then it's a lot of fun. Commanding units from mid-air is surprisingly satisfying and watching the carnage of a well-planned out move was always entertaining. As each unit has a unique ability, I carefully thought about how to best use these abilities together. For example, by activating a bubble which slows time, I fired a volley of rockets into a group of helpless enemies. And as all the environments are destructible, it creates many blockbuster action moments as walls of buildings are blown off. I also loved how the cover an enemy was hiding behind crumbled before their eyes. But even though there are moments of greatness with Disintegration's FPS-RTS hybrid, it always felt as if one side was Dr. Jekyll and the other Mr. Hyde, and I was watching them try to kill each other. If we look at the RTS side, it is already at a disadvantage due to the limited number of buttons on a gamepad. Combine this with half of the buttons already used to reload your weapon, swap weapon or zoom, and V1 are left with even less retail to play with. In order to facilitate the FPS gameplay, the RTS side has suffered. On top of this, you're never too powerful so you're forced to rely on your units. And here, in order to facilitate the RTS gameplay, the FPS side has suffered. While I am conscious of the fact that V1 are trying to rewire our AAA military shooter brains, I never felt like both systems worked quite in harmony together. Copy that, mate. I wish I could give you an honest review of Disintegration's PvP, but I couldn't find a match when I logged in 7 days after launch. I queued up in quick play for 15 minutes, then each playlist for 5. The next day I tried again, and the day after that as well. Across all 3 days, a notification appeared on screen, telling me that the servers were live and healthy. So, this means that a week after launch, there were less than 10 people looking for a multiplayer match in Disintegration on the Xbox One. This is not good, as I hate seeing unique ideas fail due to a lack of player interest. As I began scrolling through the PvP menus, I was even more gutted that I didn't get a chance to play, as the 9 crews to choose from are extremely creative in design. There's the King's Guard, piloted by a knight in full armour, wielding a longsword, Neon Dreams, a cyberpunk biker gang, and my favourite, the Lost Ronin, a robot wearing samurai armour and each crew has a unique grav cycle, units and abilities that all fit their theme. For example, the King's Guard has a medieval style javelin launcher. All of the 9 crews are interesting in design and because of this, encourage you to use them. Compare this to other class based PvP games like Bleeding Edge where only half of the heroes are actually interesting. It's obvious V1 were passionate about every crew and I bet they had a lot of fun designing them too. There are loads of rewarding systems built around the PvP too, like challenges, skins, banners and Halo style badges. I did notice one glaring issue with PvP, the inclusion of microtransactions. Personally, I think this was the wrong decision for Disintegration. It's a brand new IP from a relatively tiny studio, so why potentially ruin its chances by trying to monetize its multiplayer? I would have done the exact opposite and made the multiplayer extremely rewarding, like in Halo Reach and have everything unlocked in-game. If we feel like we're being heavily rewarded after every match, then perhaps we would stick around for a bit longer, or even recommend the game to our friends. Because some of the customization is really cool, like this skin for the Lost Ronin. Some skins are just recolors, but there are definitely a few items I wanted to chase after. Of course, you can earn credits in-game, but if this is similar to other microtransaction based PvP games, I imagine the rates you earn credits is pretty low. To avoid settling on the first conclusion, it is possible that the servers for Disintegration are region based. If no one was playing near me, then naturally games would be difficult to find. Alternatively, 
there were problems with the servers, but seeing as they were listed as healthy, this seems unlikely. I even checked how many people had actually completed an online game by looking at the achievements for Xbox. I was shocked to discover that only 18% of people had actually completed an online game within the first week. 18%! There's also a high chance that the majority of these people were reviewing the game before launch. Just note, if you buy Disintegration for the Xbox One, you will currently be unable to play half of it. We're hard at work alongside the dev team to do everything we can to make improvements to the game, specifically the multiplayer and the issues with queue times. We are all actively working on some solutions to get you into matches quicker. Rest assured this is our top priority and everyone at Private Division and V1 Interactive are working hard to make sure you can all enjoy the game and have a good experience in matchmaking. Playing through Disintegration for this review, there were times I had a lot of fun. After the initial hours, and once V1 gave me a wider arsenal of weapons to play with, the gameplay started to click. It's clear that the people at V1 are extremely talented developers, simply due to the way it feels to play Disintegration and the overall polish of the game. I experienced no bugs throughout my entire playthrough. But when reaching the end of a level, and facing off against waves upon waves of enemies, this feeling quickly vanished. Due to the core mechanics of the game, be it hovering in mid-air on a slow-moving grav cycle, or due to the constant hand-holding with your units, it felt as if the odds were always stacked against me. And while I was initially lured in by the unique and interesting premise, in the end I was left frustrated as no further depth is added. The questions asked during the game's introduction were never answered, and I finished the campaign none the wiser to when I began. I had a French bulldog named Napoleon. There was so much potential for disintegration, like Halo before it, to be revolutionary. But due to the size of the studio, limited budget and scope of the game, the end result falls significantly short of the mark. Perhaps if Disintegration gets a sequel, then the game may reach its full potential. But sadly, in its current state, due to half of the game being unavailable due to technical issues or a low play count, Disintegration is not worth your money, and most definitely, not worth your time. Thank you for watching my Disintegration review, and actually my first ever video review. I've been reviewing games for the past year and a half in written form, over on my blog 26.co.uk, shameless plug there, um, but I've only recently started this YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this review, please give me a like, share the video, and subscribe to my channel to help me get off the ground. And of course, let me know if you agree or disagree with my thoughts on Disintegration in the comments below. It's always good to hear both sides of an argument, and I'm sure there are people out there who love the game. Okay, see you on the next review.